Okay, if I could uh, ask everybody to move in and take your seats, we'll get started. Uh, I'm uh, Craig Nixon. I'm the CEO of Academy, and it's really my distinct uh, honor uh, to introduce this panel. Uh, we're also a proud sponsor of the Aspen Security Forum. And Clark, I really appreciate that you do it in alphabetical order. So <laughs> our name change is starting to work itself out. The plan's coming together. Um, it's our first, first year here participating. And although we've only been here for a year, we've been part of the network that I've heard talked about since 1997. We provide security and training. And we do it for US government institutions that are represented around around this, and as I look around the room, frankly, in a different name, we've provided personal protection for a lot of the members that are in this room. But I think uh, security, as, you, as we have been talking about all week, is not about reacting to it. It's how do you avoid it or how do you prevent it? And this is a perfect panel and a perfect topic. Uh, I've had a lot of roles in a lot of different places, and I've had the distinct privilege uh, to serve uh, with a number of the panelists in combat. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Josh Gersten and serve with that, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you all had a good lunch and uh, the uh, post-lunch stupor doesn't set in while we're having the panel. Uh, you can all see Admiral McRaven up here appears to have brought some reinforcements. Uh, unlike last year, we got a panel of four people who are all working in sort of the same area, uh, I noted that again this morning we heard the Afghanistan example, the notion of what happened there uh, in the 80s and 90s and the way the situation was sort of uh, allowed to get away from us. It seems like there's a commitment by the people on the panel and others in government to make sure that that doesn't happen in various places around the world that uh, are seeing a fair amount of conflict and strife, places that we consider sometimes to be failed states. 
but saying that we won't take our eye off the ball and figuring out exactly what to do in those places, I think, are two uh, very different things. And doing that in the current environment of trying to contain uh, costs, I think, is also uh, a pretty tricky thing to do, both costs in terms of financial costs and uh, the attention of policymakers and the attention of the American public. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our uh, panelists just in order uh, of sitting next to me. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Major General Tony Thomas. He's the um, former Deputy Commanding General of Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, has just come out uh, uh, a month ago out of Afghanistan, uh, where he was the Special Operations Joint Task Force Afghanistan NATO Special Operations Component Command Afghanistan uh, uh, commander there. And he previously served as an assistant commander in northern Iraq, uh, where in August 2008, according to something I saw in Army Times, he was traveling in a vehicle near Mosul that was rammed by a suicide bomber. Uh, he made it through that uh, intact. The vehicle didn't make it through intact, as I, as I understand it, but it, it did its uh, job, apparently. Uh, sitting next to him, we have uh, Ambassador uh, Rick Barton. Uh, who is Assistant Secretary of State for Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Uh, he began working in diplomatic posts in the U.S. government more than two decades ago, working on democracy building uh, with USAID in places like Bosnia, Rwanda, and Haiti, and held a post-conflict reconstruction post at CSIS for mo much of the, uh, the aughts of two the 2000s. He joined the State Department in the Obama administration, working at the UN before being confirmed in March of last year as the first head of the State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Uh, as a political reporter, I feel compelled to note that he spent some of his early career working in politics. He uh, won the Democratic House primary in Maine's first district in 1976, but was defeated by the Republican incumbent, 57 <laughs> to 43, according to what I didn't, what, I didn't what survive I, the crash. Research, no, he didn't. Um, <clears throat> And then the next gentleman needs no introduction, Admiral Bill McRaven, commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command since August 2011, previously uh, the head of JSOC, in which he oversaw the raid that killed uh, bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan. He commanded several different SEAL teams and groups thereof before overseeing uh, a special operations uh, command under NATO in Europe. Um, and then we have Mr. Sheehan. Michael Sheehan is Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations low intensity conflict serving in that post since December 2011. He's had really an incredibly broad career serving in uniform as an Army Special Forces officer in Latin America, hostage rescue and counterinsurgency efforts, peacekeeping in Somalia and Haiti, in the George H.W. Bush and Clinton National Security Councils at the State Department. Uh, after all that, he decided to become a cop, essentially, uh, and became the Deputy Commissioner for Counterterrorism at the NYPD, serving in that capacity for three years before becoming a terrorism analyst uh, for NBC and then uh, to the Defense Department in this policy post that he has now. Um, I thought we'd start uh, with uh, General Tony Thomas here uh, because you're just out of Afghanistan. Uh, let's talk about Afghanistan, how things uh, are going there, what you were doing there in terms of trying to build, build up uh, the capacity of the Afghan military, uh, not simply the regular forces, but I understand you're working closely with their um, Commando units, are they called Kandaks or Kandaks or Kandaks, something close Kandaks. to that? Um, how did that uh, mission go and how ready are those people going to be uh, to take over when we dramatically scale down our presence there and as we're hearing the last few weeks, maybe even go to a zero presence? What's going to happen? Thanks. I have 55 minutes to answer that question. No. Right now, or, <laughs> take um, a couple minutes. Yeah, um, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, this it has been incredibly enlightening for someone who has been uh, myopically focused on Afghanistan for the past year, so uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to broaden my, my uh, perspective a little bit. Um, I run the risk uh, that a lot of previous commanders uh, are stereotyped as uh, saying we were winning when I left, um, in that, um, in that uh, there has been an extraordinary change in Afghanistan over this last year. Um, and I would defer to the endless visitors we've had uh, very senior folks uh, uh, from both the administration, from, from journalism, et cetera, over the last bunch of months who've come into Afghanistan and wandered away muttering, saying something odd is happening here, mostly attributable to the Afghans. Um, it's not the U.S. military that's continuing to spout the, you know, our, what we have hoped to achieve over time. It's Afghans who are literally saying we're taking charge of our own destiny. 
Uh, we have voted vis-a-vis -vis Afghan local police uh, to throw off the mantle of, of the Taliban. Uh, we desire a better life, and we sure hope you're staying. And that is part and parcel to the discussion. Uh, and as General Allen has described over time, the biggest uh, uh, battle that we have fought is the uncertainty of how this will end. And I personally don't like the three-letter word end because truly it's got to be a transition. It's not going to abruptly end on December 14. Nothing's going to end at that point. We're going to transition to something, and, and therein lies the debate. Uh, over this last year, uh, the, the change has been extraordinary. Um, and as, as General Allen pointed out in the Commander's Conference when we first got there, uh, the, the challenge we had was the, the overarching perception <clears throat> that we aren't winning, but we're leaving anyway. And that was, that was truly what we were battling against. Um, he he uh, defined winning force in, in very specific terms. So has General Dunford as, as, as we've continued this campaign. And, the, and you should know that there has been great campaign continuity. It has not been new boss, new ideas, new change, deviating you know, every other year, different way of fighting the war. We, we at long last, in about the 08, 09 time frame, finally got onto a collective campaign uh, you know, a, a designed for where we wanted to be at the end of the day. It's contingent on Afghans taking charge of their own security. They have done that in spades this year. Uh, I have been up, you know, as, as I escaped Afghanistan a, a month ago, I can't help but go back to the early bird every day or stars and stripes every day to see what's the bad news coming out of Afghanistan. I am, I am uh, very encouraged every day that I don't see it. It's almost gone to mute. Now, that's, there's a bad news story with that because it, it does contribute to the idea we've won, right? We can come home, it's all over. And, and really, we've just transitioned to an Afghan lead. But they are carrying the fight to the enemy. I commanded a formation of 14,000 uh, special operations forces, about 11,000 American uh, special operators from every walk of life, and about uh, 2,500, 3,000 uh, allied uh, from every walk of life. And when I say that, I'm talking about United Arab Emirates, Jordanians, Brits, French, et cetera, all the, all the normal characters, but a truly eclectic formation of about 25 uh, different countries that were absolutely focused on the task. More importantly, we were aligned with 14,000 Afghan Special Operations Forces who are out every night uh, taking the fight to the enemy. And every, it's, it's uh, kind of ironic, is every day they want less and less of our help. They're, they're soft guys. They're special operators. You would think that they would have that kind of animus that they want to do this by themselves. And they're shedding you know, their, their, their need for us to, to support them out there. The most extraordinary thing, though, over the last year has been the, the advent of Afghan local police. Um, last year, when we first got, when I got there, it had been in its formative stages for about a year and a half. Um, we were trying, really, to uh, get the Afghans to assume uh, control of the program. They own that program, by the way, right now. That's, that's a Ministry of Interior program. Uh, they nominate where, where they want to grow Afghan local police. And the, the tail on the tape, when you talk about classic counterinsurgency, if the population's the center of gravity, for nine years we had Afghans that watched as almost a spectator sport of us against the enemy. And over this last year, in, in droves, the Afghans voted to join the effort and to take up the fight in places like Zari, Panjway, Ghazni, uh, places where the Taliban had run the roost for a long time. Um, the other part that I would offer to you is the enemy is in utter disarray right now. They, they, their great hope is that there's another 19 months that they just have to suffer through, that we will leave at the end of 14, uh, and if they can just uh, survive the uh, in incredible uh, effort against them, um, that they, they'll live to fight another day. In fact, they, they anticipate you know, celebratory gunfire on the backside of December 14 as we leave and, and they take over. Um, so as, as we go through this period, and, and certainly uh, General Allen uh, is, is, is much more expert to be able to talk about uh, the geostrategic situation of the bilateral security agreement, the zero option as it has now uh, been uh, discussed. Um, that is, that's the great vagary right now. How will this transition over time? We have the opportunity for sustainable security in Afghanistan. More importantly, and, and uh, uh, Dep Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Carter was just out visiting us, the importance of stability in Afghanistan is important for Afghanistan, but it's a lot more important for where our vital interests lie in Pakistan. It is a platform for engaging Pakistan for the future. We are in the midst of a trilateral uh, arrangement between Pakistan, Afghanistan, and, and, and the US, but we're fading to black. And I, I was in enough conferences in Peshawar Pakistan to know that uh, while we're, we still are the big dog at the table, we are fading to enabling a bilateral uh, arrangement between the Afghans and the, and, and the Pakistanis. So uh, again, I, I think it's trending in the right directions. Can't talk to the, the challenges of dealing with the, with the government of Afghanistan on a daily basis. That's, you know, it, it's wake up and expect a sovereign challenge today and, and you won't be surprised. 
Um, but but uh, from a security standpoint, uh, we are we have made huge huge progress over this last year, and it's about time. So, General, we'll, we'll put you down as not not in favor of the zero option. I know it's not not your decision to that, make, that, but it, it yeah, sounds that like that would not be something I want my name aligned against. That certainly um, <laughs> the the options uh, uh, you know clearly are what the Afghans need as a sovereign country. Um, and that's the dialogue, it's the professional dialogue that's occurring right now. We have created from whole cloth an Afghan security force of 352,000 people. We have given them a lot of sophisticated equipment. In very short order, they've eclipsed the capability of countries, their immediate part and their immediate, uh, in their immediate surroundings. But they do need our help, um, and it's a matter of their, their government acknowledging that and, and the right kind of agreements or authorities for us to stay. Can I ask you, do you think um, uh, the police and the security forces that you're talking about are sustainable in, say, the medium term uh, with, uh, with the current level of tumult and sort of chaos, disorder, and uh, issues that we see from the Afghan government? I mean, are you building these institutions separate? Is it something like the Egyptian military that, that is almost distinct from the, the governance in the country? No, I, I think they're either demonstrating the capability. The challenge that we have, especially on the special operations side, is we had a unified command that spanned all the, the various organizations. They don't have that. Uh, so they'll need their Ministry of Interior to talk to their Ministry of Defense, to talk to their National uh, Director of Security. Uh, that's a challenge. It was a challenge for us from an interagency standpoint, but it's something that they've acknowledged they have, they have to do over time. You, you, you juxtapose the security gains with the Afghan standard of living uh, now, and I, I'll tell you, even as a special operator, that the thing that gave me the most hope every day was watching thousands of young schoolgirls go to school every day in Kabul and every other place uh, that I'd visit. Ten million Afghan students now, less than 600,000 when the, when the Taliban were in charge. They have, have really seized this opportunity. It's, it's, it's one-third of the population almost. They expect to have that kind of standard of, of living in the future. They're hopeful that we will help them sustain it. It's just the, the level of, of help that they, that they request and that, we're, that we ante up for. Um, Admiral McRaven, let me uh, move down to you. Stick with the military issues uh, for the moment, but try to broaden the picture out. Uh, we're talking about Afghanistan, but we're also seeing situations where uh, particularly uh, across Africa, there's increasing involvement of the U.S. government in different ways with uh, these affiliates of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and maybe non-affiliates that are just radical groups that we think could pose uh, dangers for us. Can you talk a little bit, you've been doing some planning, as I understand it, for sort of a 2020 vision of what the special operations forces are going to be doing or going to look like. Uh, can you talk to us uh, a little bit about that. You can work in perhaps Afghanistan into that as well. But how are you going to manage this uh, in such far-flung uh, corners of the world? I know you're doing a bit of it already, but the metastasizing must pose a challenge to you. Yeah, well, let me go back to something uh, Tony Thomas said, because frankly, a lot of the lessons learned from Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of how we did the partnering piece from a special operations standpoint, frankly, how we were or organized internally, so Tony talked about our ability to organize between kind of the strike forces. We had kind of three components in Afghanistan. We had kind of the kinetic strike guys. Uh, we have the SIFSAKE, the, the folks that build the Afghan local police and do the engagement. And then we had our NATO allies, uh, along with all of our interagency partners. And as we began to develop that kind of command and control apparatus, that organizational apparatus, we began to see effects that we hadn't seen in the previous decade. So we understood organizations are important. We understood that partnerships and relationships are important. So how do you take what you've learned from Afghanistan and then it, the good things you've learned and then be able to export that? So as we look at the partner relationships, the narrative that we're trying to build for the future of special operations is we will always be able to do the kinetic piece, I think, better than anyone else in the world. When somebody needs to rescue Americans or when somebody needs to capture or kill the enemy, I think we have the best force in the world, and we will for a long time. But that's a small part of what we do in the special operations community. The larger part of what we do is we help build partner capacity. So right now, we are in about 84 countries around the world uh, with, you know, Tony talked about the 11,000 soft folks. We've got about another 3,000 folks that are, again, in, uh, in places around the globe, some of them in small numbers, ones and twos, working in an embassy, some of them, you know, a couple of hundred folks but they are helping to build partner capacity so that frankly we don't have to come in later on and deal with the issue. Allow the sovereign government to be able to deal with their own problems. Uh, and again, the lessons we learned and how do you build an Afghan local police? 
How do you build commando candacs that you were talking about? How do you build special forces in other element in other uh, countries? We've been doing this for a very, very long time. So any any thought that this is a new idea is not correct. We have been partnering, building partner capacity since <laughs> since Mike was uh, in Latin America and, and well before that. I mean, it is one of our core capabilities. Now we've got to do it in a little bit more structured fashion. We have limited resources. We've got to figure out where you apply those limited resources. You talk about a Africa, just a case in point, when I had Special Operations <laughs> Command Europe, I, I had not only the European uh, kind of portfolio, but we, it was before Special Operations Command Africa stood up. And at the time, I had about 150 folks at any point in time on the African continent, and we were working with uh, a host of nations there. There are now, on any, any given day, about 850 you know, Americans in Africa because we recognize that's an area where they want our partnership and make sure everybody understands this is at the request of the host government with the approval of the U.S. ambassador and with the approval of the geographic combatant commander. I don't do anything. We in special operations don't do anything that doesn't have the approval of the Joint Staff OSD, the Secretary of Defense, and on the, on the civilian side in country, the approval of the U.S. ambassador, and, and the willingness and the access from the host nation and their desire to get us in there. So again, the lessons that, uh, that, that uh, Tony was talking about in terms of command structures, how we partnered, the forces that we built so that, again, countries can go on and, and take care of their own security. Now how do we take those lessons and apply them more globally? Can I ask you on a, a sort of policy front when you're looking at the 2020 picture for special operations forces. We've heard discussions at some of the panels uh, here at this conference about the AUMF and we're right. 12 years into it. Um, are you looking at those issues? Do you have any concerns that uh, the legal authorities that you have now to do what you are doing or what you think you need to do in 2020? Uh, <clears throat> is everything fine? You, you can just keep going uh, on that front exactly the way it is right now? Well, this is where I have a great relationship with, uh, with Mike Sheehan as our Assistant Secretary. So when you, when you take a look at Special Operations, you know, Mike Sheehan is essentially my service secretary. So he deals with all the policy issues. So that's a great question, Josh, and I'm going to ask Mike. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's, let's th throw it to Mike. <laughs> you want me to talk about AUMF or? Sure. I mean, in this context of what the military needs to do, uh, the Special Forces or more broadly, uh, how confident are you that by the time we get to 2020, uh, we're going to have all the legal authorities we need I, to do what we need to do. I think we doing. have them. They're intact. Uh, the famous AUMF, or the authority to use military force, was a, an authority granted to the military after 9-11, uh, particularly giving authorities to attack al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces, um, really AQAP and some other ones. And I think even without that authority, you know, prior to 9-11, I was involved in attacking uh, the Al-Qaeda and other groups and other p folks without that on their other authorities. So I, I think the authorities uh, issue um, is, is not a big one. I think what's more relevant is for the special operations community is we, the focus has been over the last 10 years uh, to a certain extent on our kinetic operations. And I, I don't mean just uh, aircraft shooting on the ground, but our troops on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq. And meanwhile, as Admiral McRaven said, we were doing security assistance missions, training, advising, equipping people around the world all through that period. Just was relatively uh, below the radar because we had two major wars going on. And we'd been doing it uh, for quite a long time before that. I was a captain in El Salvador. Uh, there were really about 12 people in the field, two per zone, that were advising uh, that country in a, in a major war. Um, very small amounts of U.S. presence. And I think in many ways, we're going to go back to the future in terms of the uh, soft mission set. And for counterterrorism, I like to break it down into two categories. One is, and, and was talked about a little bit this morning, one is we have to deny sanctuary to terrorists. Uh, we can't let them sit and be comfortable somewhere or they will be able to uh, attack us strategically. And secondly, we need to pressure the network. We need to attack uh, leaders safe houses, training sites, their assets, lines of communications, et cetera. Um, both of those missions uh, have a soft component to it. For denying space, that's normally a soft advisor training and equipping and planning and help people deny space to the enemy. Control cities, control space, ALP, the, the police forces. That's more of a controlling territory. And so the soft advisor has to have that skill set to work with the locals to enable them to do that well. On the other side, 
we want to have a relationship, the training, advising, equipping for the host country's kinetic action, for their direct action against the enemy. And I think the key here in both missions, the, the art for the soft operator, is how can they best enable the host country to do it with training, equipping, and advising, but that the final act of violence be conducted by the host country. Uh, and, and when we are successful in doing that, uh, we have then pushed ourselves back into the secondary role and enabled host countries to defend their own countries. And that's, that's our goal for the next 10 years. I, I know that you're deeply involved in a lot of the planning regarding uh, the countries in Africa that are posing a security challenge at the moment. Um, in that chain that you talk about between the training and the final act of violence, is it not the fact that in some of those countries we have in one capacity or another, um, contractors in that, in that chain somewhere, um, uh, doing some type of uh, training or advising uh, uh, forces. And what challenges does that pose for um, maintaining control? I'm quite confident that everybody under the command of uh, these two officers here will, will do 99.9% .9 of what they tell them to do. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that that can be said uh, when you have, uh, when you have uh, people that are, are not in a direct chain of command. I, first of all, contractors are a part of the landscape. From Somalia to Northern Africa to Afghanistan to, to everything the government does, whether it's running a mess hall for an for a, a infantry battalion or whether it's uh, providing technology for cyber war. Contracting the civilian part is, is essential for almost everything that we do. Uh, I do believe, however, though, in certain functions should be preserved by U.S. government personnel. And, when you, and the closer you get to the lethal action, the more it should be the sole prerogative of U.S. government advisors. And I think that's generally the case. However, when a host country is hiring contractors and consultants, it's their decision. So often we'll be in a place where we bump up into consultants and advisors that are hired by the host country. I don't think it's a major problem. I, I really don't. We, we learn to manage that. And uh, for, for the U.S. government, I think for us, uh, more, the, the more important issue is how do we develop that relationship with the host country? How do we manage the risk of our people that are, we want to push them forward so that they can help enable the host country, yet we want to not go too far so that they become part of the the, the, the action at the objective. And if we can manage that risk, uh, to me, that's, that's the most important challenge for our soft operators that have to have the maturity and the judgment to be able to provide that training, equipment advising, and then let that partner go. And that's, again, what Tony and others have been doing in Afghanistan and what we're going to be trying to do around the world. Ambassador Barton, when I was speaking um, to uh, uh, General Thomas earlier, I raised this question of, how valuable is the police force and the military force if it's standing up against a political structure that is very, very weak? Um, is that part of the area that you work in? What are the things we can do that aren't strictly military or police, that aren't security related, uh, that can improve the governance in some of these countries or at least mitigate the chaos in some of these countries? And can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in, in Syria or other places that um, uh, may be of interest to folks? Sure. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Mike is uh, leaving the federal service this week. And for those of us who've had the pleasure of working with him for over 20 years, uh, we should all give him an ovation for the great service. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure, the police and the and the newly trained soldiers have to believe in the civilians that they're working for. And if the civilians have offshored their spouses in London or in Bethesda, that is not helpful in terms of motivating uh, the, the forces. And, and so there's some really basic elements here that we've got to pay attention to. Um, and, and as I listen to my colleagues, there, there really are three core principles that I heard them bring forward that I'd like to reinforce because Part of the charge that we've been given as a, as a new bureau in the State Department, the creation really of a number of secretaries of state feeling that for whatever reason, we weren't doing as well in these places as we should. So there was a core, born from a core dissatisfaction. 
But what I heard Tony say at the beginning was really the core first principle, which is you've got to have that local ownership. And in some cases, it's taken us five, 10 years to get the kind of local ownership we needed. And there's a, that's just not gonna work because it, it, it tries the patience of our democracy. It, it, it proves uh, to our people that we're not as effective as we could be. We lose the confidence and we're working with minority support domestically, which isn't really the way you wanna take on these efforts. So, but local ownership depends on actually knowing the place. You can't possibly seek out local ownership if you don't know the place to begin with. And I mean, you could say that there could be a new Powell doctrine that maybe we should know 100 people in the country before we say, send an American soldier in. <laughs> um, or, you know, know 1,000 even. I mean, the more you know, the better off you are. And the Syria case is a classic example of that. We had a wonderful embassy there, a good ambassador there, but then a revolution came out of pretty much nowhere. It was not the mainstream business of our embassy. And then our embassy was thrown out of the country and suddenly we're working mostly out of Turkey, somewhat out of Jordan, with a population of new political leaders or players, they're not really leaders because they were just becoming players who nobody knew. And so we have, I mean, the task that we've had for the last year, using train, equip, and a number of other kind of uh, bait programs basically, has been, can we get to know a core group of the Syrian opposition well enough? Do we know enough of them? Do we know them well enough? that we could actually have some confidence that we know what's going on. And these are not necessarily the people who show up in Qatar or in Paris or in Cairo for conversations. They're the people who are actually w working their way through the country to come to a training session somewhere in Turkey and then go back in. So the second principle is you've got to really know the place. We've been talking, uh, Admiral McRaven and I have been talking about how do we get this vast information that we have into places earlier and we really know the place better because we have a bias in our system. The bias in our system is we spend a lot of money on terrorism, on drugs, on AIDS, on refugees, and guess what the intelligence system tends to feed you? Lots of information on those four subjects and a few others. And it doesn't mean that these things are unimportant, but if you're really gonna be effective in a place, you've got to have a sense of the context and of the balance, and that's the third principle, which is we've gotta be much more political in our understanding because if we, if we recognize that these civilian leaders that we've put on the white horse and we've said, ha, finally we have somebody we can trust who's in charge of this country, and then you could say this could be the Karzai model without being too unfair, um, that that it doesn't really work for us. And in, in a place like Syria, where if you were a promising political figure any time in the last 20 years, you were likely to end up dead, uh, out of the country, converted, or you dropped your business. Um, so nobody who had any political promise could conceivably be a player in that space. And so you've got to have a farm system model and you've got to bring it along and that's a give, key piece. Give me a sense though of what that means in practice. I, I'm a little confused. I understand the theory there that we need to get to know more people yeah. and if we know the systems, presumably as you alluded to, that's what our intel people are supposed to have been doing or our people in embassies in many cases. What, what do you mean in practice? What are we, before we hand weapons to somebody in Syria, what are we, are we testing them in some way? Are we doing other things with them? Uh, what kind of training are you talking about? Yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say it's woefully inadequate in almost every case, but it's the best we can do, given that we don't really work inside of Syria. We obviously have parts of the US government that are, are working inside of Syria, but it was not their main beat and they were not that well established. And they did not have the depth or the breadth that you would want to, uh, if you were, say the president. Um, but what we have tried to do is we've tried to use, initially train and equip because we had a very narrow legal window for non members of the non-violent opposition. They were, after all, the people who started the revolution there. Um, and they were the ones who took to the streets. They were the women and the students who have now been somewhat lost in, in this phase of the conflict. But nevertheless, many of them had risked their lives. I, I've spoken to probably 200 Syrians. Of the 35 or so conflicts that I've been involved in, I've never seen a group of people who are more committed to the case. This is not a recreational crowd. They have, almost every Syrian that I, that I have talked to has either lost a relative or spent time in jail. So it's a, there's, there's, a, there's a Mandela effect that is a little bit more serious than you would expect 
uh, from some of these conflicts. But we, we brought them in, we give them five days of training, we've, we've given them FM, we've created an FM radio network all over the country. So they, what kind of training? Oh, that's what well, we're trying to get the at. training initially was on technical use of, of uh, safe computers, safe communications uh, media. Uh, we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to give them the capacity to be able to communicate with each other inside the country and not get killed. So we had to train them on that. Over time, it's become more the responsibilities of being the leaders of a so-called liberated area or of an opposition area. Um, we've now moved into, actually, there, there are literally thousands of defected police inside of, inside of <laughs> Syria. They are credible in their communities because they defected. Uh, the, the act of defection was a pretty risky one. And, but they've been, they've been playing the role of police without any pay because there's no revenue stream in the opposition area. They don't collect taxes really. Um, so we're, we're trying to, we've just gotten clearance from the Senate, our last hold last week, to be able to provide stipends, very modest stipends, $150 a month, enough to keep somebody on the job. Rather have a trained policeman who's trusted by the community than have to bring in a new crowd. Uh, and, and or bring in, bring in uh, an international group that doesn't know the place. So it's obviously the shorter and easier route, although it's hardly that. Uh, but we've also given them rule of law training, uh, international humanitarian law. We have to run them through a vetting system. We, take, we use the intelligence community and everybody else who's got any record on anybody, but these are tough places to really know who you're talking about. Uh, Mike and I found out, found this when we worked in Haiti, that there were an awful lot of Jean-Pierre Jeans and Jean-Jean-Pierre and Jean-Pierre Pierre. <laughs> the vetting. And, uh, and, uh, and, and they were all human rights abusers. Right. And it, it was kind of, it was a little bit like dealing with McCarthy lists. So it was, uh, it's a tough, it was a tough business. Admiral McRaven, did you yeah, want to Yeah, I just wanted to add on the, on the soft side, because Rick's exactly right. You know, at the end of the day, you know, when we push people into, when we put people into a country, they need to be able to speak the language. They need to be culturally aware of what's going on. So. Back to Mike Sheehan's point about, you know, back to the future sort of thing. So as we're looking at kind of soft 2020, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of this is about how do I now realign forces to various theaters? So kind of post-Afghanistan or whatever the transition in Afghanistan looks like, either way I will have more capacity available as a SOCOM commander. My job, of course, as a supporting commander is to provide forces to the geographic combatant commanders. So we have sat down with all the geographic combatant commanders and said, Tell me what, your, what the objectives you're trying to achieve uh, in your theater. And so as we look at, for example, the first special forces group out of Fort Lewis, we are going to realign them or align them to the Pacific area. So they begin to learn the languages. They're going to learn to speak, you know, Hangul again, uh, you know, Tagalog again, the various uh, uh, Indonesian languages. And, so, and they're going to be culturally aligned to a specific geographic area. Uh, so that again, when we send a, an NCO or an officer in there, hopefully, like Tony Thomas when he was in Honduras, Tony's a fluent uh, Spanish speaker, uh, these are the sort of things we did before 9-11, but when 9-11 happened and we all kind of shifted our focus to Iraq and Afghanistan, now everybody speaks you know, Arabic or, or Dari or Pashto, but we've lost a lot of those skill sets. So frankly, we are reinvigorating the language program, we are reinvigorating the cultural awareness program, and we are realigning it to the theaters so that the right people speak the right languages and understand the right cultures in the right regions. In terms of number of kinetic operations, does your 2020 plan project a decline from what's going on now and how dramatic? Uh, no, because you know, we hope never to have to use kinetic operations. Okay. So a kinetic operation is if everything has gone wrong, then, then we're kind of in the position to conduct a kinetic op. Back to Mike Sheehan's point, you know, we want to be able to allow, if a kinetic operation has to be done in a particular country, allow the host nation to do that. They need to be trained in how to do that. They need to understand all the second and third order effects if they do that. We can coach them through it, but at the end of the day, let them do it. More importantly, let it become a law enforcement problem. I mean, ideally, you want to take these violent extremist networks that, that kind of have regional reach, make it local, and then make it a local law enforcement problem. If you can do that, then you can eliminate the, the terrorist threat, I think, as we know it today. I think that's a good note to move down to Mr. Sheen again to talk about. You were um, on Capitol Hill uh, a couple months ago, in May, I think. Uh, and talked about seeing a 10 to 20 year time horizon for um, the Al Qaeda threat. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit and in light of what the Admiral just said, um, is there any part in that time frame where it's possible that we could get the threat uh, to a point where it could, could be controlled in what we consider 
uh, more of a traditional law enforcement method and we wouldn't have to think about it so much as a military uh, operation anymore or a war on terror or future terrorist well, groups? Uh, before he answers, <laughs> let me say, that's the ideal, that it gets to the point where it's a law enforcement operation. Do I think we can get there in the near future? No, I don't. <laughs> Do I think we're going to get there anytime in the, in the mid-future? No, I don't think we will. But we need to strive to that, because if we don't, then we'll always be deferring back to our old kinetic way of doing business. And, and again, we've got to kind of change the paradigm about how we do business vis-a-vis -vis the threats in, in certain regions. Sorry, Mike. I think it's important to understand Al-Qaeda and that Sunni radical, violent radicalism in context. It's, it started in really in the early 90s um, and really started to manifest itself with Ramzi Yusuf in 93 at the World Trade Center. Really was the beginning of it. it this is a a 25-year narrative that's already gone on, and I think it's going to be another 10 to 20 until it burns out. And I think it will, but I'm not sure exactly when that will happen. The narrative is very compelling to a certain amount of people. Uh, that, and by the way, as was mentioned earlier today when I was in, at NYPD, we track the people uh, in, in the United States. There's a lot of them in the United States that are attracted to this narrative, and there's a lot of them that get arrested every year. Uh, fortunately, though, they haven't been able to be very capable, uh, except for the Boston or Major Hassan in actually killing Americans. The narrative will be around for a long time. But I, I think the, the other thing, so remember that, this isn't going away anytime soon. And our ability to affect that narrative, I think, is really on the margins. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I think it's also important to recognize how successful we have been since 9-11. We've already put Al-Qaeda on its heels dramatically. Their ability to attack us strategically has been pummeled in the last 10 or 12 years. And I think it's important to understand that, because if you always inflate your enemy, you, you play into their hands. Uh, and so I think for the next 10 or 20 years, if we continue to do things smartly and continue to transfer the action to our, host, our partners around the world, we will be able to continue to marginalize Al-Qaeda's ability to attack us strategically. And over time, it'll be increasingly the job of the host country of security forces to do that job, and, and I think that's what, how it's going to play itself out. But I agree 100% with Admiral Craven that we will remain uh, very active in this for quite a while. And, and if you look at the President's NDU speech, which I advise people to really take a hard look at, a very comprehensive, long speech, a lot in there. But a major part of that speech was a very vigorous defense of retaining the option for U.S. unilateral kinetic action. That was a major part of the speech. But the rest of it, and what we're talking about here today, is how that is the option of last resort, as Admiral Craven said, and how our challenge now is to push that action to, to the locals. And I think we're going to get there, over the, and this eventually Al-Qaedaism will wind up in an ash heap of history like others, but that, that's going to take a while, quite a while in my view. And there are no parallel threats to that that we have to be concerned about? When you say Al-Qaedaism will end up on the ash heap uh, Al-Qaeda is unique. Okay. Uh, You're not talking about Islamic radicalism Yeah, no, Al-Qaeda is unique. And, and, and I think it's important to understand why Al-Qaeda is unique. And really, this is the importance of bin Laden, who not only shifted the narrative to the far enemy. He basically said, all of us uh, Muslims have been fighting these apostate regimes for years and years. We can't be successful until we take on the Americans. So that was the first thing he did, was he shifted the model with his fatwas in 96 and 98. And the second thing he did was he justified the indiscriminate use of killing civilians with a religious context, that it's too bad that a lot of Americans died at 9-11. It's, it's sort of a, a justified collateral damage for their vanguard of violence. So Al-Qaeda is unique in that they are determined to use violence and determined to kill civilians in broad numbers in an unrestrained way that that's, makes them unique from even some of the worst other terrorist groups around the world. And when you say you see their narrative petering out over the next 10 or 20 years and that we, are, we can affect it only on the margins, is that on the downside and the upside? Do you think there are things that we could do that could amplify their narrative or resurrect I, it? I, 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 I think it's worth trying and doing. I, I honestly don't think we have much to say about it. Uh, I think what's interesting, if you watch the Arab Spring, how the Al-Qaeda narrative was absolutely absent from that entire uh, action over a several year period going from one end of North Africa all the way across the Arab world and elsewhere uh, where Al-Qaeda was not even part of the 
conversation. Now, they've taken advantage of some of the disruptions that have taken place as a result of the Arab Spring. But I think most of the Islamic world have rejected uh, that vision of the, either the political vision that the Taliban uh, manifest or the violent vanguard that Al Qaeda manifests. General Thomas, I was going to yeah. offer that. I think there are some very tangible examples of where this approach is or have already paid dividends. Three years ago, when I was Avram McRaven's deputy, uh, the challenges of Yemen and, and Somalia loomed large. We had very little, if any, options. Our options were purely kinetic. We had no, nobody there on the ground. We didn't see the threat as it blossomed. Uh, and the options to put boots on the ground was restricted. So you had one option. You could drop bombs. And so that, that was the option we pursued. In very short order, we are now working by, with, and through the government of uh, President Hadi there. They are carrying their load more every day. Is it to the level that we, we, that we think is satisfactory? No. That's why we need to continue to prod them. In Somalia, it's even more unique. With a very limited U.S. You know, uh, presence on the ground, we're working with the Kenyans. We're working with a lot of other people who have a vested interest in their neighbors being stable uh, with, a, with a light signature, a light touch, um, but keeping the pulse so that, so that we're not having to respond in extremis. You hear in extremis all the time. It, it's exactly the way we've been re reacting and responding, in extremis, as opposed to proactively seeing threats before they emerge, working partner nation capability, Best of all worlds, as, as Secretary Sheehan mentioned, they handle their own business, whether or not they ask for help or not. Uh, and then worst case, we have to do our own bidding. But it's a, it's a continuum and not just a break glass when needed tonight uh, type, type affair, which has been the default for, for a long time. You talked about a light touch, though. Obviously, in Afghanistan, one of the concerns with the narratives of the Taliban and other groups there is that our footprint became so large and now remains so large that it, that itself feeds a narrative. I think President Obama himself has said this uh, at different times, that it simply is too easy to blame every problem on the United States, uh, whether it's an internal Afghan problem, security problem, the lights not having any you know, power or whatever. Um, isn't, is that not a concern? And when you're putting, you're talking about putting more boots on the ground in various places around the world, we only face a backlash when we have a major military intervention like Iraq or Afghanistan, or are we going to face resentment and, uh, and backlashes in some of these other countries? I think it's a balance. And, and there again, I'd, I'd reinforce what the ambassador said and Admiral Craven, we're not doing anything unilaterally anymore. Uh, the, I, I, I had several interactions when I was at the Pentagon with folks that would challenge us all the time, or what are the boogeyman authorities that you have as DOD to go do things unilaterally? We don't. Um, and, and, we, and we have to work it in concert with the ambassador in, in the respective country with a campaign design towards whatever our goals and objectives are. And I think you're seeing, I mean, if there's been anything good about the last decade, it's galvanized this effort across the interagency to work together towards some sort of common objective. Now, our, our political cycle you know, uh, wreaks havoc with that if, in terms of continuity sometimes. But at, at least in terms of respective countries, regional approaches, et cetera, uh, we're a lot more coherent. And, and the military offers that opportunity, you know, for, for especially with our resources, to, uh, you know, to, to uh, provide those inroads. And, and just to finish on the Afghanistan point, you think we could go to a lower profile there uh, while uh, not suffering the, the backlash issues that we're con concerned about? We could maintain a low profile there and not? We are already on that train. I think most of you know that. Uh, by this time in February, we'll be half as big as we are right now. That's, that, that's an inevitable uh, path we're on right now. We're trying to balance that. Somebody mentioned the other day that the Afghan capability stands up as we uh, draw down. Uh, as I mentioned, they're much more prominent in, in terms of uh, closing with the enemy and, and being uh, on the front line. But, but there again, commanders on the ground will, will give you their best estimate in terms of the pace of that. Um, uh, you know, the surge was absolutely effective. It went to an end date instead of an end state, but it, but it made a difference. Um, and and, and we, we are, uh, we're trying to measure that through some sort of transition, and time will tell how we, how we manage Ambassador that. Ambassador Barton, quick comment, and then yeah. I want to go to the audience. What, I, what I'd like to say is that over the course of the two days that I've been here, I've heard a tremendous amount of creativity, much of it directed at containing a problem. And what I think the opportunity that we are not using as aggressively as possible is how we use our American ingenuity to, to solve a problem and to get at it earlier. So for example, even in the Syria case, you have 1.8 million Facebook users inside of Syria. You have 80,000 LinkedIn business people in Syria. 
Um, you have, we have ways of reaching people. You have, you have the range of, of satellite television all over the place so that the regime control of messages to their people is it's not absolute any longer because people, 10 million Syrians a day, want to watch something else. And they're going to find it in the region. Um, We've, we've really got to exploit those openings. They're all over the place. I, I just spent a week in Nigeria. A lot of people are worried about Nigeria. Very quickly, what I'd say is that the society is about 20 plus years ahead of the government. That is not unusual. Um, there, that, that dynamism, that energy, that desire to get on with things is all over the place. And we've got to be able to capture it. And that, we haven't been structured to do that as creatively either. So a lot of the creative energy that I've heard here, we've got to use on the, on the civilian side better as well. OK, let's um, go to some questions from the audience. This lady over here. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Lori Sutton here. As an old soldier, I'm struck by the magnitude of the load that each of you is shouldering in your respective uh, rucksacks. So thank you all for your leadership. Admiral McCraven, my question's for you. It seems that trust, or the lack thereof, has emerged as a, a dominant theme, threading its way through so many of our discussions the last couple of days. So I'm curious, what is your assessment of the trust factor within your command, and what is your strategy for keeping the faith with your SOCOM family over the long haul? Okay, well, let me make sure I understand the question. Trust vis-a-vis -vis who? The SOCOM command and? Between the leaders and the led family members, the community, in terms of the load that, that okay. it seems SOCOM will Force. be carrying increasingly over Roger. the long haul. Yeah, yes, thanks. Sir. And I'm glad you asked the question. And this is, uh, uh, frankly, I could, I could talk for hours on this because uh, I've been asked uh, often, you know, what's my number one concern as we move forward uh, with the special operations community? And my number one concern is the health of the force. Uh, we had, last year we eclipsed uh, by, unfortunately, about a half a dozen, the highest suicide rate we've had, and frankly, we're on uh, track right now to eclipse that. Now, that in and of itself is not necessarily an indicator of the force, but it's something you absolutely have to pay close attention to. Uh, when you look at the indicators in terms of uh, depressions and domestic abuse and the whole, uh, you know, marriages breaking up, etc. None of the trend lines are good. So about uh, two years ago, actually three years ago, my predecessor, Admiral Eric Olson, who was here earlier, uh, put a task force out to take a look at the problems in the force. And, and that, that uh, report landed on my desk literally the, the day I took command. And so we, myself, uh, my, my wife, my command sergeant major and his wife, and the entire uh, senior leadership have gone out to pulse the force to find out what can we do to help you. And so we have this Preserve the Force and Families initiative. And we have been working with Capitol Hill and OSD and benevolent organizations to, to tailor programs to make sure that we keep folks, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines healthy, both you know, physically, mentally, and spiritually, but the families as well. And this was a component. The services, of course, have the responsibility uh, or have the authorities to, to take care of the families. What, I am, what I'm trying to do is find out where uh, the services have done magnificent work but frankly, where can I help from a SOCOM standpoint to, to contribute to that? Um, I like to think that, uh, that we're making some progress in that area. I think the trust factor, and this was one thing my command sergeant major said when we did our first trip about a, a year and a half ago now. He said, you know, every SOCOM commander kind of comes down and talks to the troops and does an all-hands call and says, you know, we're here for you, we're going to take care of you. And, you know, the family's been hearing that for a long time. And, and everybody tries to do that, but you can't just talk to talk, you got to walk to walk. So we are making every effort possible to take care of the force and the families. Uh, and, and I like to think that that is going to build that trust factor. I like to think, and, and frankly, we, we test whether or not my thinking is correct. Uh, but I, I like to believe that we are making some progress and those trust factors are coming to play. Uh, we do virtual town halls uh, every quarter. Uh, George Ann and I were just on one uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's great. You have interaction. Can you talk about the Facebook piece? We do a Google Hangout. And the interesting thing about it is the Google Hangout is open to everybody in who wants to get on Google Hangout. It's unclassified. Now, we set it up so that the components and the families can talk to us to tell us what their issues are. But this is the only way I'm going to know. You know, you can't go completely through the chain of command. You've got to talk to that young spouse who says, Admiral, let me tell you what you're not hearing. That's what I need to know. So, and that's the way you build trust. You respond to what their concerns are 
And again, we are absolutely committed to doing that. Are we going to be completely successful? I don't think so. It is a function of scale and the, the degree of the problems, but we are putting forth a full effort to get at it. Thank you. Uh, how about this lady in the center? Hi, Ellen Sabin. I formerly um, served as the president of the Flying Doctors of Africa, which is the largest public health NGO in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I really appreciated um, how much you, you all emphasize the, cult the need to culturally understand where, where we're working. Um, because of course, Kenya and Somalia and a lot of the areas where we had 900 staff members um, or hotspots. And my question is, given that a lot of the embassy staff transition on the quicker side, are you working with indigenous NGOs or US or European NGOs who tend to be on the ground for a very long time, know the language, stay, and are they an asset that you use for some, uh, you know, we're in refugee camps, we're all over the right. place, we're in the Rotary Club. Are you working with the NGOs? Yeah, let me field it and then I'll turn it over to, to Rick. Uh, the answer is not near as much as we'd like. We have extended the olive branch, but as you can well appreciate, non-governmental organizations are very reticent to work with the uniformed military. So frankly, what we are doing is we're partnering with USAID. In fact, I was just with Raj Shaw about three weeks ago. We have a, uh, an effort to, to figure out what, are the, what does the problem set look like in the Sahel. I mean, we've got a, a full court press we're using USAID resources to understand the fragility of certain countries so that then we can get back with the US AFRICOM commander, with the ambassadors out there and say, look, this is what USAID and we are seeing. Would it be good to have some civil military affairs folks on the ground to help build wells in this area, to bring them clean water, to, to develop schools? The issue isn't, do we want to work with the NGOs? I will tell you, I would love to work with the NGOs. The issue is the NGOs really just, they don't want to work with us. And we understand that concern, but it does complicate our ability to be successful on the ground. And Ambassador Barton, yep. can you also address, uh, you, you talked about going out and contacting the people and getting to know all these people. How do you do that in a, a post-Benghazi <clears throat> kind of context where there's this extreme security concern? A lot of these embassies in, in dicey places, people aren't even allowed to go out without a security detail. Uh, how, how do you make these dozens and hundreds of contacts mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, across the civil society? Well, it's, it really is a challenge. The, the, the short answer to your question, and I'd like to maybe tell you a quick story about something we did in Kenya that I think will be of interest, but the answer is yes, we do work with, we're totally opportunistic, we're shamelessly opportunistic uh, about, because we, you just have to find who's most capable, and that's the answer to your question as well. Well, we wanted to do a review in, in Libya of whether there was a possibility to help contain the militias through a more dramatic use of civil society because we were already hearing that there were many local groups that are trying to contain local militias in their own communities. And we thought, hmm, that seems like an opportunity we want to take advantage of, but we can't get anybody into the embassy. We can't get anybody into the country. If we send somebody in, we've got to send them with so much security. So we found a Jordanian woman that we trusted tremendously, and she went out and did 60 meetings, met with every civil society group she could. And then we brought her back to Washington, and we walked around for about 40 meetings so that at least some people would, would see how talented she was and the work that she had done. And we introduced her to the new ambassador who was going out there, and we tried to get that information into play because at the end of the day, I mean, we've been hearing about it for two days. You're only as good as what you know. Could I just give one quick, it's not quite as quick, but I'll try to make it quick. Try to make it, we're um, running out of time. I, I see I've got <laughs> next to no time, but in Kenya, we were asked to work by the embassy and we ended up having a kind of a, 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 a delicate embassy situation uh, on the election related violence. And the, the AID, Democracy and Governance Officer, we decided that there were two hot spots that needed particular attention, the Rift Valley and Coast. And so we, put some, we got some people out there, we sent them with their own security, but I felt that after seeing them out there for two months, there was no way they were gonna get literate. They were gonna be as effective as they needed to be in the period of time that we had leading up to the election. So we, so we had a meeting of all the people who were getting, the United States government was spending about $800 million a year in, in Kenya, most of it, the vast majority of it for AIDS. But we had the 12 or 14 people who were working the portfolio of the US government there for a meeting in the Rift Valley. And, and, I, and I asked them, first question, 
what do you think is the most important problem facing your country this year? And guess what they all said? Election-related violence. It was obvious. If, they, if, if, if we had the, a, a recurrence of what had happened four years ago, every program would be set back at least a decade, not just four years. So are you doing everything that you would like to do on that problem? No. Is there something you might be able to offer? Maybe. What do you have? The first person to speak was a guy who ran a horticulture program. He said, well, I've only got 4,000 farmers in my program. Now, my feeling, I said to him, look, I've, I've been involved in American politics. With 4,000 people to start with, you could be elected governor of any state but Texas. Uh, and, and the next person to speak was the AIDS program. And that person said, we visit 220,000 households a, a week in this area. OK, now we've been told the police were totally incompetent and there was not an early warning system. Does that sound like there was a marriage possibility? And there was. They came together. They created a champions of peace. We can't take credit for their not being, for the violence really being negligible in this last election. But it was a good use of the of the talent. Go to that gentleman back there. I think there's a mic right behind you. Thank you. Um, my question is for uh, Secretary Sheehan. Uh, just to rephrase Josh's question earlier, where he asked you if you had the author, if you if you were, if you had the authorizations under AUMF to do your special operations kinetic and non kinetic. Let me ask it another way. Would you be able to do your special operations, kinetic and non-kinetic missions for counterterrorism without it, without the AUMF? Yes, and we did it before AUMF. There was counterterrorism before 9-11, and we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we found and killed terrorists before that and before AUMF. I, I think AUMF brought a, a, a good deal of, deal of clarity, uh, and I, so I thought the authority was very useful over the last 10 or 12 years. Should it be revised? Perhaps, but... I told Senator Inhofe in testimony uh, a couple months, if it's not broke, uh, don't fix it. He, he had mentioned that, and I said I subscribe to that. Uh, Kim Dozier down here. Thanks, Kim Dozier, AP. Um, the president, in his counterterrorism speech this year at the NDU, said he had a preference for counterterrorism to be carried out by the military, not the CIA, considering your current jobs. I thought that was a... Good question to ask. So how do you take on more of that mission, considering you want to expand your stability ops role? Thanks. Sounds like a policy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was, yeah, let me take a quick crack at that. I, I was asking my hearings about that, about the, the president made it clear at, at NDU that over time, he'd like to see kinetic action be done by the Department of Defense. However, he wasn't going to do anything uh, hasty that would upset uh, some of our very important operations that are going around the world. And I don't want to get any specifics other than that. Um, and, and so I think that over time, that's his intent, to move that type of lethal action into the Department of Defense. Uh, but, it, but it's going to take a while. I, I will say this about not only DOD, but uh, the, our whole government. Uh, and, and Admiral and I have both talked about Back to the Future, the difference between the capability of U.S. Special Forces, like when I was a captain in El Salvador, compared to what is now, it is really staggeringly huge difference. And, and part of the reason has to do with a lot of people in this room on the business side. The technologies that we bring to bear in this, in this fight, and particularly in the kinetic action, the intelligence, the intelligence fusion, the ability to identify bad guys, and then very selectively target them with a minimal collateral damage is extraordinary. And, and I think uh, it's, it's hard to underestimate how important that is and why Al Qaeda has suffered so much over the last 10 or 12 years, because they have been literally decimated um, at the top uh, over the last 10 or 12 years. And that has to do with the extraordinary professionalism, Admiral McRaven's folks, and, JSOC plus the other special operations community, uh, combined with the, the, the technologies that we have now, uh, both the intelligence and the weapon systems we have, uh, puts an organization like Al Qaeda, which is uh, still using technologies from the 60s and 70s, perhaps some cell phones and computers, maybe 80s and 90s, at a tremendous disadvantage. And, and if we can continue that advantage, uh, we're going to keep them on their heels. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a lot of discussion here, I think, of various places in Africa. There Zero. is a panel uh, later today, I think, discussing that in more detail. I want to, uh, with, with General Ham, I want to thank uh, everybody on the stage for joining us today and for their <laughs> service.
Thanks a lot. I'm not going to